the Gilda's maximum lawyers community of legal entrepreneurs who are taking their businesses and lives to the next level. As a Guild member, you'll build relationships, be held accountable, and learn strategies specifically designed to get you unstuck and accelerate your plan for growth. Members are also granted exclusive access to masterminds hosted around the country. Our next event is coming up, and we're heading to Scottsdale, Arizona. There's something truly magical about the power of these in-person connections where real-time breakthroughs happen. Picture this. You're surrounded by like-minded law firm owners tackling your business and mindset challenges together. The energy is electric, the insights are transformative, and the results are game-changing. Investing in yourself is the best decision you'll ever make. The knowledge, strategies, and breakthroughs you'll gain are priceless assets that will supercharge your practice and propel you forward. Join the Guild and secure your ticket to Scottsdale at the best possible price by visiting maxlawevents.com. Run your law firm the right way. way. This is the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Your hosts, Jim Hacking and Tyson Mutrix. Let's partner up and maximize your firm. Welcome to the show. In today's episode, we're throwing it back to a presentation from MaxLawCon 2018. Wayne Pollock, the founder and managing attorney of Copo Strategies, shares his presentation, Engaging the Court of Public Opinion. Let's get to it. We are here today to talk to you all about engaging the court of public opinion, both for your firm and your practice, but also for your clients. And we're very lucky to be joined by two members of the St. Louis media community. Closer to me is Jeanette Cooperman, who is a staff reporter, a uh, staff writer at St. Louis Magazine. And to her right is Robert Patrick, who is the federal courts reporter for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. These two uh, journalists here are going to give you nuggets that you're going to be able to use immediately, again, for your practice, uh, your firm, and for your clients' cases. We're also scheduled to be joined by PJ Rendawa, who is the investigative reporter for the local NBC affiliate, KSDK. She got called out on an assignment, which interestingly uh, involves a legal dispute that we'll get into uh, a little bit later. But I want uh, Jeanette and I want Robert to briefly introduce uh, yourselves to to the group. Uh, Tell us a little bit about what you do now, uh, how you got there. Uh, I would like to know in one word uh, what your interactions with attorneys have been like previously, in one word, choose wisely. And finally, for any attendees who have only one hour in St. Louis of free time, please give us one thing for them to eat, drink, see, or do. Jeanette? Okay. My name is Jeanette Cooperman, obviously. I've been staff writer for, I think, over a decade. I was the editor-in-chief for a while and hated it, really missed writing, cried, begged to go back, and they offered me the job of staff writer. Before that, I worked for 10 years at the Riverfront Times, which was an alt news weekly here, still is, doing investigative reporting. Uh, and a little bit of everything. So let's see, my one word for my interactions with lawyers, I had to think about this, would be revealing. I'll just leave you with that. And I think you should go in one hour to City Museum because it's a quirky, edgy side of St. Louis that you might not otherwise see. I was going to say the same thing about City Museum because uh, just as a visitor, it's a great place to go, but as a lawyer, you're going to go there and say, I can't believe they get away with it. Yeah, (laughs) right. (laughs) So I'm Robert Patrick. I've been uh, here in St. Louis since 2004. I was originally covering St. Louis Circuit Court, so just the building over there, I think, or over there. And then I've covered federal court since 2006. So I, you know, I struggled a little with the word on. I, I'd probably say cautious as my interaction, <laughs> you know, relative to my interactions with lawyers, uh, because it's or maybe complicated. You know, one of those. <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks so much. So before we get into the details and the nitty gritty of our conversation, I want to give you some context for why we're here with a panel of journalists at Max Lawcom 18. I was fortunate enough to be on episode 72 with, with Jim and Tyson. As I joke, it, it ran December 2017, so it was a nice early Christmas, Hanukkah, or Kwanzaa present for listeners. And it is clear that attorneys should be thinking about and using the media in connection with their marketing, but also in connection with their clients' service, the services they provide their clients, the actual providing of legal services to clients. 
from a marketing perspective, when attorneys talk to the media, they're likely going to be doing it in a couple of a limited contexts. One is newsjacking. We have a particular advocate for newsjacking uh, with us this this conference. But uh, Mitch discussed newsjacking. I won't go into it in any more detail. But in addition to newsjacking, there is the art of attorneys building relationships with their local reporters, with their beat reporters for their courthouse, or for our staff writer from their local monthly lifestyle entertainment magazine. Because as cases come up that aren't in your firm, but are in the real world, that are newsworthy outside your firm, you have the opportunity to comment on those cases. And by doing so, you are going to be able to show referral sources, prospective clients, and other members of the media that you have some type of expertise. And if Robert is writing about the tribulations of the current governor of Missouri, and you're a white collar criminal defense attorney, you better be emailing Robert and saying, hey Robert, I saw your coverage recently about the governor, I'm not involved in the case, but I've had cases before where I've dealt with X issue. And guess what? Robert might get back to you and say, that's great, I'm not working on anything right now, but next time I have something, I'll, I'll give you a call or I'll, I'll email you. There's a marketing component for you talking to the press in addition, you get good SEO benefits from talking to the media because you are getting your name in a high value, legitimate, credible publication like the Post Dispatch or St. Louis Magazine or whatever your local newspaper is. So there's very much a marketing a component here. But many attorneys don't understand or don't realize that they can ethically, strategically, and proactively talk to the press about their clients' cases. And when you do that, you're going to get another round of benefits. First, you can actually help resolve the case more favorably because you might be able to encourage a favorable settlement depending on what side of a case you're on. You might be able to find additional plaintiffs or defendants based on news reports when an article runs about the case that you're involved in and now you get a phone call. Someone read that article. Now note, they didn't go on PACER, they didn't go into your local state court system, but they read the article in their daily newspaper where you're at. And they call you and they say, I had the same problem with that company or I had that same problem with a different company. Or perhaps someone comes out of the woodwork and says, you know, I'm not involved in the case. My brother used to work at that company, and he has this memo that I think you might want to know about. Or I have some documents, or I know somebody you might want to talk to. They might have some information. In addition, depending on what kind of practice you have, if you're in a high-profile criminal or a white-collar criminal defense case, you should be talking to the press as a way to rebut the adverse publicity that is likely going to taint the jury in a year or 18 months. Very important to remember that prosecutors are very media savvy. And guess what? They have relationships with Robert, even if he's not willing to tell us that. Prosecutors who are smart and media savvy are going to go to Robert ahead of time, let him know about the indictment that's gonna be filed tomorrow or in a couple days, and you as a defense attorney are on the outside looking in unless you are quick and you are able to respond publicly to those cases. So you have a, a client resolution benefit here. You also have a client relations benefit. There are many practices in here where clients want you to tell their stories. They don't want other people to suffer the way they've suffered. They don't want people to go through what they've gone through. And by you telling them your, their story, you're doing something most attorneys don't know how to do or aren't comfortable doing. That's going to build a relationship with that client. That's going to lead to better referrals. That'll lead to more forceful testimonials, online reviews, et cetera. And finally, like newsjacking and like, mar like the general marketing, you'll get some marketing benefits from talking to the press about your clients' cases. Material for your website, material for your social media feeds, for your email newsletter. Uh, in addition, you'll get SEO benefits. You'll wake up referral sources and prospective clients who may have not thought about you for a while, but they see you in the newspaper litigating a case or advocating for a client, and you get that benefit. And I'll add, when you are involved in a case actively and there's a news report about you and your case, that is a much more forceful marketing tool than simply commenting on somebody else's case. Does anybody in this room think, really, that Michael Evanetti will never, will ever have to market himself ever again? No, because you are all watching him litigate in real time, and you are all thinking, even we as attorneys are saying, damn, if he was my attorney, he'd be out there doing that same thing for me. Now, we all know that he has a case that's like a once in a country's history type case, but nonetheless, you all have local examples of this where high profile cases that are being covered in the media by attorneys who are media savvy help those attorneys resolve their clients' cases, build relationships with those clients, and help market those, those attorneys for future cases. So let's start, Robert. I want to hear from you. What is newsworthy? What, when is a lawsuit 
newsworthy to you that would make you want to write about that case? I saw that question in there and I was like, that's, that's such a complicated, I mean, that's, I don't know if you have time to, for an answer to that one. <laughs> because, you know, my first response would be interesting, but then there's also sort of important too. I mean, there are these, there are these broader issues that are, they're ending up in court and, you know, sometimes things aren't really that newsworthy, but I just want to get them on the record. And so, you know, I sort of dispose of them quickly. So I, I think, you know, it's interesting to me or to my boss saying, write that story or important or that, that's it in a nutshell. You know, what strikes you about certain certain issues and legal disputes and cases that make you perk up? Well, for us, it's, it's a little bit different because we're always late to the game. I mean, we work three months ahead and often the stories I'm writing about that are legal are done. You know, maybe there's an appeal or maybe it's over, but it's compelling because we can do it with depth and we can put it into context and there's an arc, you know, there's some character along the way. It's something, if I'm trying to get somebody who's not in journalism to think of story ideas for me, sometimes I'll say, okay, can you see it as a movie? Which sounds really fluffy, but I don't mean it that way. It's, it's got a driving storyline and a point where you're not going to be sorry you invested the time. So it's a little different. I'm, I'm not under the same kind of pressure. Where, where do you get your story ideas from? Robert, are you monitoring Pacer as the federal court reporter? Are you monitoring Pacer? How much does that influence your cases versus a, a, a lawyer or maybe a client or somebody else calling up and saying, hey, there's a case just filed. In case you missed it, it's this docket number. Yeah, we spend a ton of money on Pacer because I try to check the filings every day. I mean, you know, civil and criminal stuff. We've got a couple of things running that will sort of monitor ongoing cases. So if there's a new filing, that, that, that type of thing. And, you know, appeals court filings, things like that. And then I'm not as good about this as I should be, but, you know, some of it just comes from calling people up, you know, what's going on, what's interesting. And then people will call me and say, have you heard about this? Whether that, whether that's an attorney or, you know, PR person or something like that. Like, are you aware that this is going on? Or if I've written about it before, they say, you know, the, the resolution of this case is near, you know, are you interested in writing about it? So it sounds like what you're saying in another way is it's important to have a relationship with you because if I build a relationship with you or if anybody here builds a relationship with you, that becomes a person you might contact to see what's going on in the legal world, cases they've heard about, cases they're working on. Well, like, you know, if, if I have an Im immigration question, I mean, I've, I've worked with Jim before. And so if I have an immigration question, he's, you know, sort of my go to immigration guy. Think about that. You heard, I mean, that's good for Jim and that's good for Robert, but think about that in your own local geographies, how you could build a relationship. It's not going to happen within 24 hours or a week or a month, but by building a relationship, by not pestering reporters, by giving them the things that you think they'll want, which we're going to discuss so we can help educate you from that standpoint, you can build a relationship. So the federal, beat, the federal court's beat reporter in a major city like St. Louis goes to this guy when there's an immigration issue that he either wants to talk about or that he wants to learn more about. That is incredibly compelling and for a very small investment. I mean, it's a few emails and phone calls occasionally, you're building that relationship. So whereas we hear about newsjacking where they're very much one-off type things, remember there's more to you building a relationship than just a one-off thing. It's you building an ongoing relationship with reporters in your area, the reporters that you know are likely to be covering the kinds of stories that you have. I should add, please ask questions as we go. We get all kinds of pitches and some, I mean, the, the, the truly effective ones are the ones that, that Wayne describes where like, if there's, you know, our governor just had, a, had one of his criminal cases dismissed in, in the court, courthouse across the street and there were a number of issues associated with that case and if someone sent me an email, that's probably preferable because sometimes people call me and they just launch into something and I'm like, you know, you, you got to ask me you can't call me at 4.45 and say, and just start, you know, talking. But if you send an email and say, like, hey, I see that this is an issue and I'm an expert in this, then, you know, you, you, you drastically increase your chances that we will listen to you. Um, there are also people who send us, you know, stuff on everything they do. And, and the bar goes way up on, on that person because it's like, hey, I, you know, I filed a really boring case today. And then and they'll send me 20 
attachments that are, you know, every piece of paper in the case. And the only thing that differs between that person and one of these people who sends me a stream of consciousness email and conspiracy theory type of thing with different colors and fonts and everything like that is, <laughs> is the bar degree, you know? <laughs> so well, so yeah. it's very helpful. It can be very, very helpful. I was, particularly if we're desperate for, you know, I mean, yeah. it, it's sometimes hard to find somebody who is an expert in something. Yeah, I was actually going to make that point because it's a little frightening to realize how our coverage is skewed because there are a handful of attorneys that I know and like and trust and I will call them. But anybody who calls and says, I know the kind of thing you do, this might interest you, will be great. Uh, the nice thing about an individual lawyer is you guys are busy, you're not going to waste time. So I'm very, very disposed toward it. Unfortunately, the law firms that go hire a media person to send out news releases, it lowers the chance because that person to prove themselves is sending out a bunch of stuff. And it's like, oh, guess what? We have five new um, whatever partners, principals, paralegals and secretaries. Paralegals. Yeah. And, you know, so I'm sorry you know, that that drops it down. So it's much better to hear from you guys about a specific case that, you know, is the kind of thing that we do. That's direct and that's really helpful. And I don't have to know you. It just has to be a good story. Well, I mean, one shortcut for that would be, is this the kind of story you would tell, you know, you, you go home and tell your spouse or significant other or whatever, you know, here's what I did today. It was really interesting. Not the, not the kind of thing you guys might talk about with a colleague or, or, or something like that. But like, I mean, what, what kind of case is, is something that you want to talk about with people who aren't in the industry? You know, because it, we'll talk about journalism stuff that would, you know, bore you to death. You guys will talk about legal stuff that that is hyper technical, maybe, and would bore us to death, or we or you'd lose us entirely. So, you know, it, it's we talk we in the we talk sometimes about like talk pieces or you know something that gets people talking. I mean, everybody talks about viral stuff now, you know, just in terms of good stories. Is it? We could probably have a separate conversation on providing us with video and audio and, and stuff like that. Oh, it, it's. I mean, for me, it's. I very, very rarely will an editor, the only time that happens is if she sees a press release first that she gets excited about or she sees something that the competition has and says, we, we have to match this. But it's, it's all, it's all, you know, 90 plus percent self generated Yeah, same here. So let's talk about news releases for a moment because as an attorney, I'm often concerned, I often dissuade clients from doing press releases because from a defamation perspective, it is much better for a reporter to work off the complaints and them to report the allegations of the complaint. They'll be protected from defamation by the necessary exceptions because you are accurately, the fair reporting privilege, you're accurately reporting a public document. For you as an attorney, I've mentioned this before on the Facebook group, you are not protected by the litigation privilege exception to defamation when you talk publicly about your client's cases. You have to be very careful that when you make public statements, including even in a news release, that you are not defaming your adversary or, or the, uh, I guess, the, the, um, put your adversary's clients. So statements you make in your complaints are fine when they're in your complaint. But if you copy and pasted them into a news release, you better have the necessary language like, as we allege or as we claim. Um, so I'm hesitant about news releases because it's easy for attorneys to get tripped up and not add those magic words that protects them. I'm curious about news releases announcing developments in cases. So for example, should we have an attorney spend an hour and write up a 500 word press release that really only serves to get your attention and direct you to the actual substantive court filing? Or should we instead write a two paragraph email? Say, hey Robert, uh, I thought you might be interested in this case. We filed a case against you know, XYZ alleging ABC. G give me a feel, please, both of you please, about, about news releases and your, your view of the value um, and its, uh, uh, its impact on making you actually interested in the case. I would much rather have the email. Usually a news release is sort of crafted for an agenda and I'd much rather have something direct and concise that says, hey, go check this out. I, I just trust it more. Yeah, uh, same thing for me. I, although, I mean, I, I, that email <laughs> and a copy of the complaint or the attachment, you know, whatever you, whatever you filed, whatever has happened, saves me a ton of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the only reason to use a, a, a press release is if you don't, you don't know who covers that beat 
at whatever media organization you're targeting, or you know, it does that sort of that's it's not spam exactly, but it, it has the same effect of, as spam. If you're sending this out to 50 people, you know, maybe you get one or two people that's interested. If you send that email, that targeted email to reporters you know cover a certain issue, you know, I think it's going to be more effective. Yeah. More effective. Unless you're having a press conference, you know, and you just mm. want to blanket right. for the people who can't show up at the press conference but want to report on it in some way, maybe online. I mean, it, it may be worth your time to go to sort of figure out who in your community covers what. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of do that based on the, the, the stuff you Read see. Read what they do, yeah. I, you know, there's less and less specialization, particularly, I think, among TV reporters, mm -hmm. you know, as everybody gets smaller. Mm -hmm. but you can kind of still tell what people gravitate toward. And right. That's helpful. So two points. One, in terms of news releases, we are not telling you don't write news releases. <laughs> news releases are very are. important for your firm, both in terms of SEO. David Meerman Scott has a chapter in his most recent book, uh, New Rules of Marketing and PR, about the value of news releases. And he's dead on. One, it helps with the SEO because you're, you're talking about your firm, you're talking about uh, cases, and you're talking about events that if people Google those types of cases, it might pop up. But you're also educating your prospective clients and referral sources when they come to your website. Because you might get a referral from another attorney, but you might not be the only person that they are referring. There might be two or three other attorneys. And if you have a newsroom on your website that's full of ethical and <clears throat> strategically crafted news releases that are explaining to a, a, a clients what you do for clients and the results or just that you filed a claim or, or you did something, that's impactful. And it's not just litigation. It could be tax and estates. It could be immigration. You should be writing news releases that explain the work you're doing for your clients. So those could be used internally and for the website. I think we're talking here about using them externally for uh, the uh, purposes of, of getting media coverage. And I have to caution you all. Please, 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 please be very, very careful about ever sending a complaint that you wrote and signed to a reporter through email. There is terrible, repeat, terrible case law across the country, including uh, in my home state of Pennsylvania, the PA Supreme Court about uh, 10 years ago ruled that attorneys are not protected by the litigation privilege defamation when they send even an as-filed court-stamped copy of a complaint to a reporter. The, 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 the PA Supreme Court ruled that attorneys aren't covered by the privilege because when they send the, the complaint publicly, the, the privilege, which covers things that we say that are relevant to a case and that necessarily arise out of a case, think about a demand letter or a complaint, that doesn't apply when you email a reporter because emailing a reporter and talking to the media, at least in the PA Supreme Court's view and many other courts' views, is not something that's either relevant to a case or that necessarily naturally arises out of a case. If you are in a state where this case law is operative, you will lose as a, as a matter of, you will lose on a motion to dismiss that case. It'll go to discovery and summary judgment because the court will rule, well, yes, as a matter of law, you could be liable for defamation by sending this complaint, but we have to actually now go to the facts and see if it was truly defamatory. So long story short, email Robert, email Jeanette, the docket number. They're big boys and girls. They know how to get the documents <laughs> from PACER. There may be some times where you have some type of administrative filing or court filing where they can't get it publicly. Well, then you might have to be a little bit creative in terms of how you get it. But if, it can, if it's a type of document like a complaint that contains allegations and your name is in the signature block, you better think twice, three times, even four times about sending that document uh, to a reporter and really probably anybody who is an agent of you and your law firm, because it can probably get traced, it can get connected back to you. So I want to make sure that we all understand that. That's not ethics. That's pure defamation and litigation privilege side of it. The Guild is an insanely productive community of lawyer entrepreneurs with a growth mindset who share their collective genius and hold each other accountable to take their careers and businesses to the next level. But in 2021, we are upping the game. In addition to exclusive access to the group, FaceTime with the two of us, discounted pricing for live events, and front seat exposure to live recording and podcasts and video, we are mapping out for members the exact growth playbook with our new program, Maximum Lawyer in Minimum Time. As a Guild member, you'll build relationships and experience content specifically designed to complement your plan for growth. For a limited time only, the Maximum Lawyer in Minimum Time program will be offered for free to all new Guild members. 
Join us by going to maxlawguild.com. All right, so we talked about press releases. How can we as attorneys tailor our pitches to you? I know we talked previously, we had a prep call about uh, the session, and we talked about um, targeting. And, and we know that there are people out there, PR people, but also attorneys, who just blast out press releases or emails to people who would have no reason to want to ever read anything like that. So how do you find targeting working for people who are attracting you to stories? So what are they doing to catch your eye? Not just the substance, but how are they actually talking to you specifically, Jeanette, and you specifically, Robert? What works for me is if they say, oh, I read that story you did back a few years ago, and this, I think, would be taking that another step or, you know, something similar that you might be interested in, because then I can relax. They're not assuming that 10 other things are possible that I don't actually do. So, you know, if, if they're just sort of conversant, um, that helps the most. It's really not that tricky. It, it's just it's hard on you guys because you have to read media and watch it and listen to it. But as soon as you do, you're going to know immediately oh, that's somebody that might be interested mm -hmm. in this. It's really not rocket science at all. You know, there's no mystique to it. And most organizations' websites will tell you what everybody does. Mm -hmm. um, I think my, my job is getting rarer and rarer. Okay. You're a luxury, um, but sure. we're glad you're here. Uh, right, right. <laughs> you know, as, a, as someone who, who covers federal co courts only, obviously I help, help out in other beats. But, but you know, there's, there is, I think as Jeanette said, there is going to be somebody who who covers more crime stories than somebody else or court stories or things like that. And, you know, so if it's, if it's a court story, preferably a federal court story or something that kind of, you know, a, an interesting legal issue or something like that, then it's a good thing <clears> to, send, to send to me. You know, if it's, if it's about staffing and, you know, like we said before, five new paralegals. Yeah. Yeah. And I would actually say, even if it's somebody whose work you just like, and maybe they're writing about science or medicine, you could try and say, have you, do you have any interest in this? And I'm talking now in the areas where people are really forced to generalize. You know, at a city magazine, I'm it. So I write about everything. So if there's somebody like that, that <clears throat> maybe isn't a beat reporter, maybe isn't specifically doing law or crime, but you really like their work, you think that they dig and they're responsible <clears throat> and you like their writing, I would try because a lot of us are being generalists whether we want to or not. I happen to like it, but, so I not, wouldn't narrow it down too much. So I'll add a couple of things. One, think about who typically covers the plaintiff or the defendant in one of your cases. If you're suing a school district, who is the education reporter? Uh, that's easy to do. And also, here's a really easy tip. If you're suing a school district and you want to figure out who you should be talking to, Google that uh, school district and the word lawsuit. You might find your daily newspaper. You might find trade publications. Let's, let's not forget that for many of the types of defendants that we sue, they have trade publications, chemical manufacturing industry trades, pharmaceutical trades. And these reporters, either on the hard copy uh, uh, media or are their online component, they need material. They need eyeballs for the ads and they need traffic. And lawsuits are inherently interesting. As Robert said, there's conflict. There are two sides to the story. There's always a theme, David versus Goliath. And again, they protect, they're protected by defama from defamation when they report the juiciest most insane allegations, they could simply say, well, as alleged in the complaint. So they have, a be they, they have an interest here in reporting interesting stories. I want to talk about a little bit about um, what I would call advanced techniques for, for pitching reporters. I want to talk about exclusives and embargoes. I want to read a text to you all that I got from PJ, who can't be here based on the story. She said, she's working with an attorney to do an exclusive with her client. It's about police sexual assault, very touchy. Uh, so PJ was a reporter who, who we hope to have joined us today. So let's talk about exclusives and embargoes. Can you give me, uh, Robert, an idea of an exclusive, an embargo, and if attorneys are using those types of tools with you? Yeah, people use embargoes all the time. And I think it... Can you uh, def describe what it is? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, here I'll, I'll give you an advanced copy of this lawsuit that we're filing next Tuesday as long as you don't report on it before then. And, and I've, had, I've had prosecutors do that. We, you know, there's a prosecutor who did it one time because it was a DNA case and it was fairly complicated. And they said, 
you know, we want to give it to the newspaper so you can explain it to everybody else, mm -hmm. essentially, because it was just kind of controversial. And mm -hmm. so rather than have somebody try to read through a 50-page decision in this case, they can read a, a newspaper article and process it a little easier. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. I mean, I, I, I find it helpful because, you know, rather than competing with whatever else you have going on that day, you have a little time to look at this thing and maybe they have a little back and forth with the attorney, like, hey, can you give me a picture of your client? You know, this talks about police reports. Can I get copies of those? Is there a video? And you have all this stuff teed up for when, you know, when the lawsuit is filed. You know, obviously you have to make sure that it actually is filed. <laughs> it's the same as it was when it was provided to you three or four days before. Mm -hmm. But I usually don't have any problem with them. You have to be careful that people don't tie your hands in a funny way. I mean, we always say, like, if you're giving, you're embargoing this, but if this news breaks elsewhere mm -hmm. or if I find this out on my own, then, mm -hmm. you know, then it's, it's sort of. Do exclusives matter to you based on your beat? In your publication. So that would be where we say, okay, Robert, we want you to have this and we're not going to give it to anybody else until you publish it. So I guess embargoes are a form of exclusives, but not all exclusives are embargoes. So an exclusive would be, again, Robert, we want, we want to talk to you first about it and then we won't give it to anybody else in the city or in the state until you've reported. That, that always seems like more of a TV thing to me, because they're always slapping exclusive on everything. <laughs> As PJ <laughs> texted me, yes. Right. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, she proved it. Yeah. Right, no offense to the, to the, you know, it's just, they, they have more competition within themselves. You know, mm -hmm. we're the only daily paper in town, so exclusive in the Post-Dispatch. Right. I don't know. <laughs> it's okay, it depends if you don't overuse it. I mean, sometimes people will say, you can have an exclusive on this, and I'm like, mm, you know, and I, I I feel I feel a little uncomfortable putting you know some some reporters will ask people not to talk to anybody else and I I've never done that because it just seems mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cheesy or ethically gray or something like that. I can never bring myself to because usually it's something where they need or want people to know about this and we're so you know three months out and I can't bring myself I would love the exclusive but I can't bring myself to say don't talk to anybody else it doesn't seem democratic it doesn't seem fair and nothing's really exclusive for very long anyway no. because you know sometimes what people have done and done to me in the past is you know let's call it there's no news channel 8 but news ch in St. Louis news channel 8 has learned Da, 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 da. And, it, and the way they learned it was by reading in the paper. Right, so, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, even if it is exclusive, it doesn't mm -hmm. doesn't last long. Right. So when, when should a lawyer send you a story? Because there's, there's different tensions there. We have a rule against pretrial publicity and ethics rule. We have... We can get into that too, by the way, if you want to uh, talk about well, that. And, and I just don't, because I don't know, but what if I want to not... What if, what if they want to ask for confidentiality? And I know you don't do that, but, but what if that's a value to my client? Mm -hmm. uh, and that could be a value, so when do I play that? Do I want to do it when the case is filed? Because then it's just a he said, she said. Do I want to do it after I settle the case or win it at trial and I won and I got a better story? But then maybe the conflict's gone. So that, there's some different, I've always thought in that there's some different tensions going back and forth. And I'm curious as to your view when you want to get that story. And if you're going to talk about that in a minute, I don't. No, and well, I want to. I want to hear you. Got, I have some thoughts to share. Um, I want to um, hear their their side too. As a plaintiff's lawyer, you probably want to do it when it's filed because, you know, there's a triggering event. I mean, it's timely for us. Something was just filed, and it makes all these claims. And that's probably a really good time to do it because whoever is going to be your opposing counsel won't have seen it yet, and will probably tell us we can't comment <laughs> on pending litigation. So you you know you have the soapbox to yourself, exactly. And then, exactly. Right. and then when these when this thing resolves itself, I mean, it's there are a couple of mechanisms that we can use in St. Louis to track these things that that aren't that common, and and it's hard to track these cases. So when it's resolved, that's a great time to do it because, you know, it's unlikely that someone's going to be paying attention to that in your local city. You know, I mean, kudos to that reporter who's who's checking this thing every week or month or day or something like a really interesting lawsuit and waiting for it to be resolved. But that's just, that's not very likely. So uh, do you have anything else to add, Jeanette? Well, only that it really is situational for me because I'm doing long form and we're going back and kind of reconstructing the story. So I don't care if it's done. You know, the suspense is, needs to be in the writing as I reconstruct it. Um, but if I want to be there and cover the trial, then I sure need to know ahead of time, and I'd rather do that if it's a, a very interesting, compelling trial. So a lot of it depends on the nature of the case. 
So a, a word about ethics. Mitch and I had a nice conversation this morning about ethics. Most states follow the ABA model rule, Rule 36, trial publicity. That tells attorneys that attorneys can't make statements uh, that they, outside of court, that they know or reasonably should know will be made public and will have a substantial likelihood of materially prejudicing an adjudicated proceeding. Adjudicated proceeding is a jury trial. If you prejudice the, settle, the, the settlement discussions or the discovery, dis, discovery phase based on publicity, that's fine. What, what the, Supreme, the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled in a case called Gentile, spelled like Gentile, Gentile versus uh, State Bar of Nevada, is that we are concerned with ruining the jury trial. We don't want jurors to decide a case based on what they've heard, either a lawyer's version of the facts outside of court or evidence outside of court that might never be admitted in court. So, and even in that case, Justice Kennedy said about six months, back in 1991 when the case was decided, six months was enough time for any taint to be cleansed between a bad story coming out and the jury trial happening. Six months is enough time to clear it up. As I told Mitch, in 2018, it could be five minutes now based on the, the era we're in. But even in that rule, substantial likelihood of materially prejudicing and proceeding, there are huge safe harbors. You can always talk, always, always, always talk about the claims, offenses, and defenses in the case. If you are talking about the claims you're making, you are fine. Now, if you're concerned about defamation, from an ethical perspective, you're fine. You can always talk about the contents of a public record. And you can always rebut adverse publicity if a reasonable lawyer thinks that the, the publicity could impact the juror. The only limitation on that safe harbor is that you have to kind of stay related to the adverse publicity. So if, if someone is coming at your client concerning some aspect of that client, you really can only rebut it ethically, focus on that one, that one area. Strategy-wise, absolutely complaints. That is when it's time to talk to the media. As Robert said, it's timely. You are setting the stage for settlement negotiations with the other side. As Robert also alluded to, most corporate defense attorneys don't know jack squat about how to deal with the media. They do it very rarely. They think their client doesn't want them to do it. Their client probably does. And they just don't know. So they, so they give out that stupid, we'll vigorously defend our case, or yes. we have no comment on pending, or they'll say, we don't comment on pending litigation, but we will vigorously defend our case. So they are not, they don't know how to do the defense in terms of the media. And what's nice too, newsworthiness is sometimes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If Robert or Jeanette covers a case that you just filed, well, technically that case is now newsworthy. Why? Because you got them to write about it. So you could, as you have more developments in your case, either based on court filings or documents that you've come across that you feel you can ethically disclose to the media, maybe through some public records requests or what have you, you continue the newsworthiness cycle. Again, We'll look at Stormy Daniels. I mean, her lawyer basically dug up these, these financial documents about Michael Cohen and then has led the media cycle concerning that. There was no additional filing in that case. But the New York Times had an amazing expose on all these documents because he got the documents. He created some type of internal work product and was fine sharing it with the media. Um, so to your point, I think that the, the strategy for settlement is going to be in the, filing the complaint and publicizing that. The settlement reporting is your marketing. The settlement reporting is you showing the world, hey, look at this case. I just got $2.5 million for this type of case. Goes on the website. And if it's normally, if it's, if it's against a municipality or a municipal agency, school district, Department of Transportation, I find like those settlements are of interest to the media because it's taxpayer dollars. Let's go. We have about um, eight minutes left. So I want to talk briefly about how you work. Um, we can't see how you work. How many cases are, are, how many stories are you working on, reporting on at any given time? Probably too long form, and they're usually about 5,200 words a piece. And so one researching and one writing, and then about five to eight shorter pieces, and then a lot of online stuff. She's working a lot harder than I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me, it varies. I mean, it, it's fortunately, I don't have anybody telling me you have to write four stories a week or something like that. It's kind of, I mean, I definitely have my slow periods and then there are periods like the last two months where it's been like drinking from a fire hose. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and you're, and you're sort of sloughing off all of this stuff that isn't urgent and hoping to pick it up again later. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I, try to, I try to keep some longer stuff going at the same time as I'm doing these other things. And then depending on how busy I am, sometimes I'll 
a case, a, something that I would like to turn into a story. I'm just like, here's four paragraphs so I can be, so I can take this off my to-do list. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why there's value to the embargoes and the exclusives that we talked about a few minutes ago. If I know Robert's generally very busy and wants to bang out a 500 word article about a case, I don't want that. I want a thousand words. I want him to interview my client. I want him to dig in through, into some documents. So what do I do? If I know I'm filing a case, a lawsuit, a week from now, uh, two weeks from now, I get on the phone, and if I trust Robert and I have a relationship, or even if I don't, but I have a hunch, I want to do an embargo or an exclusive, and I say, hey, look, we have a case. I can put you in contact with my clients. Mm -hmm. They're willing to talk. I've got some video. I've got some documents you might want to see. A real-world example of this is I have a client who is going to be suing the state that uh, the, he's in. His law firm is suing the state for violating federal law regarding special education services to students. Very trendy topic, it involves taxpayer dollars, but we don't want the story to be a 500 word blurb that's just gonna get reported on by the local newspaper. We want the reporter to dig in because it's a bigger story. It affects thousands of kids across the state. So what are we doing? We are looking at different reporters that we, who cover the education beat, and we are going to work with them to see if we could secure through an embargo, an, ex an exclusive right to run the first article, and then if that goes well, then we expect tag-along coverage by other reporters in the area. So it, it's a toolkit. Again, we, we talk about the media as a tool on your legal services toolkit, or tool belt. I guess kit is far away, tool belt is much closer to your body. <laughs> you should be thinking about this. Not every case is gonna come up where you have this ability, but I'm willing to bet in each of your files in your office, you have a case within the past quarter, past uh, you know three months or so, that could fit the bill either to be newsjacked or a case that could be of public interest had you thought about ethically and strategically and proactively going to the media. And, and just let me interrupt for a second. In the example that you gave, probably most of your community's reporters are not going through the filings every day. I mean, when I was only covering one courthouse, some, you know, I, I sort of wavered on whether I should be doing it multiple times a day, checking the civil filings and things like that. But then, you know, we, we don't have one reporter covering that courthouse anymore. And so we try to check these things, but, you know, it, it's tough. And, I, and, and that's the newspaper. And we've got a ton of reporters as compared to some, some other media organizations in town. So it's very, very likely that no one is going to be checking these filings. And the only way that they're going to find out about some of this stuff is if someone tells them. So I was going to leave this as my final thought. I'm going to not, not now because of Robert's comment, but I firmly believe that you, as, you and me and us as attorneys for reporters like Jeanette and Robert and the people in your hometown, interesting and newsworthy lawsuits are like needles in a haystack. They don't always know where to look. There are cases filed in state courts with terrible online court systems. PACER is not exactly Google. But we as attorneys have the key. We know where those needles are. You should be thinking about how you could help the reporters find those needles in the haystacks that are local, state, and federal court systems. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, as we wrap up, how do you verify the credibility and authority of an attorney who contacts you and wants to tell you about a case he or she has, or, as I said earlier, wants to comment on a case or a newsworthy legal dispute? I make sure they're in good standing if I have any concerns about it with the bar. Make sure there are no complaints. Word of mouth. Look at previous cases. Look on Nexus, you know, just to get a feel for anything that seems scandalous. But... Otherwise, this is a small enough town. It's usually, you usually already kind of have a feel. So, Are you judging them based on their website? Are you looking them up on social no. media? Are you looking at... I, the only time I would pay attention to a website, honestly, is if it looked like it was really losing objectivity. I mean, there was a lawyer that had stuff out there about his case that was really, I thought, questionable. Mm -hmm. So if, if they're going over the edge and sensationalizing it, that would make me nervous. Otherwise, I don't really care how polished it is. I just would want their track record, you know, as a lawyer, that they're solid and not in any trouble. And Robert, when, when you... Same for me. I mean, I, I, I do occasionally run into lawyers who don't have websites and whose phone numbers are hard. That's to, heresy, by the way. <laughs> this well, it, it's, it, it's weird, but it's not... It still happens. Mm -hmm. okay. But, yeah, but basically the same answer. Interesting. All right. We have a couple minutes left uh, for questions. 
I think, you know, because of the different roles that we have, I mean, if a lot of times if I'm on deadline and someone wants to shoot me an email or even a text with an answer to my question, I mean, I, I'm happy as a clam because I can, I can drop that in. We don't have to, I mean, there are some lawyers I talk to that when that, when I see his or her name in the caller ID, I'm like, there goes 20 minutes, 40 minutes, something like that. <laughs> and I don't always have it. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I mean, however you want to get the information to us. I'm always amazed at how free some lawyers that I really trust and respect are with their cell phone. And <laughs> you know, I'm like nervous thinking, okay, is this thing going to ring in court? They're pretty good about remembering to turn it off. But um, that helps a lot because going through the whole voicemail thing, you're right, it's ridiculous. People are in court. By the time they're done, they're, they're exhausted. Text for a quick answer is great just to set up a, a time that we can talk. Um, even better. Before I ask for any more questions, I want, to all, I want to offer you all a gift from me. I typically give this to clients and people who attend my CLEs, but um, I have an infographic that I suggest that you take and you put by your phone in your office. It's a script for when reporters call. And even though you now have a newfound love of reporters for Robert and uh, <laughs> one more you give me a high five. <laughs> no, I want to see what it says. So what we do when I advise my clients is that when a reporter calls you cold, and you're inevitably in the middle of something. Don't get into a substantive conversation with that reporter. You are not in the mindset, and they don't want your unthoughtful comments. So you thank them for the call. You tell them you're in the middle of something, but you're interested in talking to them. You ask them what they're working on. Most importantly, you ask, when is your deadline? They have deadlines. Not, t not uh, two weeks or three days like lawyers do. They have minutes or hours. And then you say, thanks for the call. I'll get back to you by your deadline. Um, it is something that I have found has helped my clients when they get a cold call, they're in the middle of a brief, and they don't, they stammer, they stutter. You want to build a relationship, and the way you do that is you thank reporters for their call, you engage them politely, tell them you're busy, they understand, guess what, they're busy too, but you, you get from them what they need from you, you find out when you have to get back to them, you say thank you, you hang up the phone, and you've now gotten off the phone, you've given yourself some time to think substantively about your response, We've also maybe made a new front. Any questions? Any additional questions? I guess if I'm already covering it, uh, because I'm so limited, you know, I'm just doing that long list of stories I do stretches over time. So I'm absorbed in one single case. I'm not looking for other random cases. You do more. When you, when you said you wanted to share an interesting thought, I was thinking, but then when you said areas that haven't been covered, mm -hmm. I have a different reaction. Because if, particularly if it's, like if you call me up and say, you know, I want to talk about something that's going on in Miami. I'm going to be like, yeah, I mean, I would like to be in a position to write sort of like a think piece about something that happened over here, but it's just not, that's just not my job. But if there's something going on here, or if there's a connection, you're like, did you know that this thing going on in Miami has a really, really interesting connection to St. Louis? Then, you know, you, you might have hooked me. I mean, I'm always interested if someone's like, oh, What's, what's, what's so interesting is that, you know, a lot of times people who are in the middle of a case will, will be like, well, I can't believe you don't see this, <laughs> you know. Uh, people love to play that game with me. They're like, well, I, I can't believe you don't, you know, that you can't see what's going on here. And I'm like, you're in the middle of this mm -hmm. thing. Or whenever it's somebody who has more access, you know, they've got, they've got subpoena power. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're looking at all this stuff, and, and it lays out this great story, and they're like, boy, you know. You're really missing this. And you know, we have a very narrow view on a lot of this stuff. And so if someone wants to guide us and say, you know, I understand more about this than you do, and you should look here, I mean, even people that can't talk to me, sometimes I say, is there a document somewhere that would help me out that you could point me to? So, Tina, I think what you could do is, as an example for what we were just talking about, one, if you're, you're in Orlando, if a local Orlando university or tech company is doing autonomous driving and there is news coverage around that company or that university opening up that lab, that's when you hop in there and you, you email that reporter and say, Did you, do you know about the legal issues? Likewise, all of the automobile magazine, the car and driver, all of the magazines and, and blogs <laughs> that have covered Tesla and any other type of autonomous driving systems those are the people that you want to get to also because those are the ones who think and, uh, and breathe that technology based on them covering cars. So again, there's a trade publication aspect. There's a, a hyper-local aspect of it. 
that I think you'll find when the time is right could could bear some fruit. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your time. Thanks for listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. To stay in contact with your hosts and to access more content, go to MaximumLawyer.com. Have a great week and catch you next time.